Good evening and welcome to, to this session. Uh, my name is Simona Somma. I am an evaluation officer at the Independent Office of Evaluation uh, uh, of IFAD, and I'm very pleased to moderate uh, this session on me measuring resilience and vulnerability for two main reasons. The first one is, well, let's say for, for the centrality of measurement, of measuring uh, vulnerability. And second, uh, because um, our three presenters represent the three UN Rome-based agencies. So this, uh, this session is uh, an outcome uh, in itself because it's a, it's a joint effort of the three um, UN Rome-based agencies. Um, so let me present them uh, quickly. Um, on my left, uh, we have uh, Mr. Lisandro Martin, who is the acting director of the Operational Policy and Results Division and of the Sustainable Production Markets and Institutions Division of, uh, uh, of IFAD. Um, Lisandro heads the funds self-evaluation functions, and he oversees operational policies and procedures, as well as a system to track operational performance and compliance. And he works across departments to advance the funds transparency agenda and to implement the performance-based allocation system for IFAD financing. Then we have Marco De Rico. Uh, Marco De Rico is an economist uh, at FAO, and uh, since 2009, Marco um, has been participating in the resilience uh, analysis and is currently responsible for the uh, resilience analysis and policies team in FAO, implementing the resilience index measurement and analysis. And then we have Pablo Arnal. Uh, who oversees the resilience and outcome measurement uh, for the R4 Rural Resilience Initiative at the World Food Program. Um, Pablo has extensive experience uh, uh, before uh, joining FAO, he was working for the, uh, sorry, before joining WFP, he was working for uh, FAO as a livelihood and resilience expert in West Africa, and at the moment he supports country offices to build robust monitoring and evaluation systems for the innovative R4 initiative. Uh, so our three presenters will provide us and will guide us uh, through the experience of, uh, of IFAD, of FAO, and the World Food Program in embedding vulnerability and resilience in programs. Uh, we will start with, uh, with Lisandro Martin, who will present uh, the IFAD Vulnerability Index, uh, which was recently included uh, um, into IFAD resource allocation process. Uh, after Lisandro's presentation, uh, we will move to uh, Marco's presentation on uh, the FAO Resilience Index Measurement and Analysis. Uh, and then to, uh, we will move to Pablo, who will present the 4R uh, Rural Resilience Initiative, which is, uh, um, which is uh, an initiative to enable vulnerable uh, rural families to increase their food and income security by managing, by, by managing climate-related risks. After the three presentations, um, uh, we will have a Q&A session, so I would like to ask the presenters to keep the presentation at 10 minutes, 8 to 10 minutes, if possible. Um, so I will now give the floor to, to Lisandro. Thank you very much, Simona. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here, and congratulations to IOE for organizing this stimulating event so far. I will do my best to give the presentation within eight minutes, hopefully. Um, what I, one, I'm going to talk about the IFAD Vulnerability Index. That is an index that we included in our performance-based allocation system as a result of the of a reform that we had just completed for this system as a result in turn of an evaluation of IOE, one of those influential evaluations that has made us reconsider the way in which we were running the PBAS and including some variables to include them, to improve the multidimensionality 
of poverty. Before, we had very limiting set of statistics, main, mo mostly the GNI and rural population to measure poverty. And then as a result of this evaluation, we realized that we needed to go to a wider dimension. I'm not an expert on indexes, but what I would like to do here is to walk you through the rationale of why we included and developed this IVI and what are some of the results that we are um, seeing in the implementation of this in the PBAS. I'm going to show you a very short uh, animation, a video right now that explains the PBAS, so I don't have to go or you don't have to go through the painful exercise of hearing me explaining how it works, and then I will focus on my words on the, on the IVI. So if we put the video of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, is to eradicate rural poverty. It is primarily funded by its member states and resources are replenished every three years. With millions of people in need across the world, it's critical to make sure IFAD's limited funds are given to those most vulnerable. To do this, the fund uses a performance-based allocation system, PBAS, to distribute its financing to different developing countries. The purpose of this system is to increase the effectiveness of the use of IFAD's scarce resources. 95% of IFAD's regular resources are allocated through PBAS, while 5% are dedicated to financing global and regional grants. Like all other international financial institutions, they are administrated in a highly transparent and predictable way. The PBAS uses a formula to assess the needs and performance of a potential borrowing country each country receives a country score, which determines how much EFAD financing it can be allocated. The system takes into account good project performance and the country's commitment to strong policies that promote rural poverty reduction. The goal of the PBAS is to ensure that resources are allocated to countries with the greatest need and that the funds will produce real, measurable results on the ground. While this system supports strong performers, IFAD also takes into account the important needs of developing member countries that might require assistance despite their poor performance. Starting from 2019, IFAD will consider a country's vulnerability through the introduction of the IFAD Vulnerability Index into the PBAS formula. Therefore, this system is designed to ensure that more resources are made available to countries where there is a high, poor, rural population and to those more vulnerable to food insecurity and climate shocks. The PBAS is just one more way. IFAD is working to meet the ultimate goal of eliminating global hunger and poverty. Thank you. So I will focus now uh, for the next three, four minutes a little bit on explaining the rationale of the IFAD Vulnerability Index, which is simply one of the elements that we highlighted to you in the new formula for the PBAS. I'll cover three questions, basically what is it, what is the IVI, um, why have we included it, and what are some of the results that we are seeing. So the IFAD Vulnerability Index is an index of 12 variables. You have them in front of you in the slide. They're putting up the screen, but it's on the smaller um, screens. Um, and it, it, it basically captures the, what we thought are the main obstacles for countries to undertake sustainable development and utilize the resources that they receive from IFAD. This index is not, it was inspired, if you wish, in the Notre Dame Gain Index, the, what is the stand for, the Global Adaptation Index, which has two main components, the components that measures the vulnerability of countries, and then a component that assesses how well countries respond to these vulnerabilities or adapt to the, to the realities of climate change. And we have taken only the first one, the one about the vulnerabilities, and we have adapted it to the needs of IFA, to the elements that we wanted to make sure that we captured in the PBAS. The IBI is not a climate change index, but it has a very heavy component on climate change. So all of the variables, the 12 variables that we have selected for the IBI are variables that are likely to, are likely to affect the behavior of communities that are affected by climate change. So we put it, um, this is how we selected them. It covers, it's a modular index, so these are trying to identify the areas that we wanted to measure, but the indicators can be replaced over time, it's better indicators 
become available in the market or if we put in place more robust um, processes to measure some of these things better. And it's captured across three different um, dimensions. One is exposure to climate change. The second one is about sensitivity to climate change. And the, last, the, the latest one is about the lack of adaptive capacity to these climate realities. One big important discussion that we had in selecting and in developing this index was where do we want, did we want to place it within the PBAS formula? We showed to you that there were two different components. What is the needs of the countries and the other one is the performance of the countries. And as I said to you before, we decided to put it in the needs part of the PBAS formula. Therefore, all, those other com all of those other variables of the ND gain that were on the, more on the adaptive side, we have put in them aside. Now, what does it mean to focus on vulnerability? And this is also a conversation that we had with our executive board um, for quite some time. Clearly, it's about obstacles, but there were two types of vulnerability that we could have considered, or, and in a way, the two of them are reflected in this index, but we focus more in one. The, the one that we focus more was on structural vulnerability, and these are all the factors that affect the way country behaves that are not due to the current will and the current policies of the country. So are things that take a very very long time to actually produce results or to change and that slow down the capacity of countries today to respond to exogenous factors even if the will is there. So many of the variables that we selected here fall within that category. So they affect the present will of countries but they are not really determined by that will. They come from, from before. The second aspect is more or less the opposite, is what we call general vulnerability, and it's about all those aspects that depend on current decisions. Now, as I said, this index didn't consider that second aspect that much. It was more about where are the long-term impediments for countries to move forward on the development agenda, particularly in the rural sector. Because this is about structural vulnerability, therefore these variables we anticipate and the analysis that we did over time is that these variables will not change radically from one cycle to another. In IFAD, we have this three-year PBAS cycle, so we recalculate our variables every three years when we conclude a new replenishment cycle, but some of these variables are updated on a yearly basis. Our decision for the IBI was actually to do it once every cycle, at the beginning of the cycle. It is also true that a lot of this data is not available at regular intervals, and this is one of the key practical considerations that we needed um, to accommodate when we developed the index. So data, not for all the indicators and not for all the countries, is available on a yearly basis. Now, clearly, from a more political point of view, or from a policy point of view, um, I, I think I, have, I don't have to say much to convince you that vulnerability is important for economic growth is clearly also important for poverty reduction, is important for policies. What we know is that many of these factors actually affect the quality of institutions, and at the same time, the quality of institutions affects many of these poor results, but it's a, it's a whole circle. And above all, as I said before, is also detrimental to the, the capacity of countries for adaptation. In, in much of our conversations with the, board, with the executive board, it was clear that vulnerability was actually the opposite of sustainability. And what we wanted to make sure is that we identify factors that can be acted upon by policies and by our programs so that they become more sustainable over time. In the PBAS formula, the vulnerability is the, the IFAD vulnerability index is the variable with the highest elasticity. By this, we mean that a change in the IVI uh, for a country implies the bigger changes in the allocations that they receive. So it's the country that is more sensitive to changes. So if a country becomes more vulnerable, it is likely that their resources will increment, the resources that they receive from IFAD. And vice versa, if it becomes less vulnerable, the resources are going to diminish. Uh, it's important for you to also understand that in the formula that we showed to you, this is a multiplicative formula. So it's not so simple. You, can, you have multiple variables that can be working in different dimensions, and the result of all of this is somehow a bit unpredictable. So you can be highly vulnerable, but have at the same time a very poor, or the opposite, highly vulnerable and a high performance, and then the variables can be working in opposite directions. But on general terms, the more vulnerable a country is, the more resources it receives from IFAD. Now, what are some of the 
of the reasoning that we had, more of the theoretical and, and, um, and discussions that we had in including a variable on vulnerability. IFAD is the second international financial institution that formally includes this in the PBAS. The first one was the Caribbean Development Bank. They included one variable many years ago that they considered that it didn't work because over many replenishment cycles, the data never changed. The reason was that the indicators that have been chosen were indicators that, you know, over time they were either discontinued or there were in a structured process for data collection, so they couldn't really use it in a very effective manner. We learned a lot from them, and then we hope that in this vulnerability index, the data is going to be available at more regular intervals. So one of the main reasons that we thought is that if the, the IBI can help for countries to contain vulnerability, in a way, when, when countries are subject to an external shock, either a climate change, a climate event, or even changes in the, in the trade uh, terms, or anything that affects their economy and their capacity to produce development outcomes for the rural population, um, that affects their performance. So over time, in our PBAS, if they, not only they have problems and structural problems, their performance is worse, therefore they are punished in a double manner, if you wish. So what we saw is that, what we thought is that by adding this index, we are counterbalancing the, the external effects and really limiting the, the discount on their allocations that they will get by poor performance when they are subject to an external shock. The second issue on the literature of vulnerability that is interesting is that there is this consensus that by adding vulnerability into the PBAS formula, you are actually increasing the development effectiveness of IFAS resources, of donor resources, simply because the marginal effect of giving additional resources in countries that have these vulnerabilities and using these resources to actually solve some of these problems is significantly higher than if you used more resources in countries that are already performing well. So when you analyze, there is plenty of literature written about the African Development Bank and World Bank allocation policies. There has been a long-standing recommendation to better incorporate vulnerabilities so that aid effectiveness is actually stronger. And the final point is I think that from a policy perspective and a programming perspective for us, we are doing a lot of analysis in, in terms of past trends, but also in different country groupings according to the different quintiles that they are in the vulnerability index to help us plan better and tailor our operations better to the different conditions that, that our different borrowers experience. So we thought it's an additional uh, variable to help us um, um, provide better services by differentiated, um, give, by differentiated our support based on the different country context and country specificities. I want to show you before finishing a slide that is about some of the results that we are seeing right now by applying the IFAD vulnerability index for our next replenishment cycle that is about to start, which is IFAD 11. So clearly we saw that the countries that are in fragile situations will receive considerable, considerably more resources. So will the countries that are small island development states that are clearly affected by many of these variables. But what we have in this slide are the four, what we call the four cross-cutting priorities for IFAD. Gender, youth, nutrition, and climate change. And we compare the IFAD 11 when we use the IBI with IFAD 10 when we didn't use the IBI. And what we see is that for every single dimension, when you rank the countries based on their low performance in each of these variables, so gender disparities, lack of youth, I think it's youth employment, the way we're using malnutrition and vulnerability to climate, when you compare all those countries that are in the bottom quintiles are now receiving additional more resources. So in a way, it, it's been a variable that it has helped us within the other changes that we made to the formula to reinforce our support to the countries that need it according to the mandate of IFAD. So I'm going to leave it there because I think there will be a lot of uh, the alarm already sound. It wasn't very subtle, so there will be a, a lot of discussions and opportunities to clarify it, and I hope um, I've been clear. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lisandro. And uh, let me now pass the floor to Marco De Rico for his presentation on the FAUS Resilience Index Measurement and Analysis. You have the floor, Marco. Thank you so much, Simona. So I understand you are going to, to move ahead of the presentation, or I can do it myself. No, no, if you. No, but it doesn't.
Like this. Okay, so thank you for being here. Today I have the, the big pleasure of meeting two of the most relevant person uh, in, for my career. One is Professor Cornia here, who unfortunately uh, swore to, to give me very hard questions, so I'm a little bit afraid. <laughs> then I met with Professor Martin Ravaglion, who unfortunately left the room when I told that we are doing multidimensional indices, so it's fine. <laughs> and then we were discussing with Lisandro how difficult it is to give a presentation on econometrics uh, right after lunch. Now we are after lunch and at the end of a full day of presentation, so <laughs> it's a complete um, problem. So, okay, I'm gonna present our, um, our uh, resilience measurement uh, indexes. Uh, RIMA, which stands for Resilience Index Measurement and Analysis, is composed by a mixed approach between uh, latent variable models and regression analysis. We are using both uh, pre-existing data and ad hoc data, uh, considering that our uh, focus, uh, our, um, our interest is on the household level. So we are talking about uh, um, surveys that are at household level. The example is the Living Standard Measurement Surveys uh, uh, Studies uh, from the, the World Bank. We are usually employing a mixed method approach, which includes both quantitative, quantitative and qualitative um, uh, data collection and data analysis. So we try to integrate the two different approaches, recognizing that one of the two is not enough to have a, a better understanding of resilience. We try to adopt uh, a mixed method approach integrating the subjective and objective, or say subjective and uh, quantitative uh, measures of resilience. Together with ODI and London School of Economics, we are developing uh, a subjective measure of resilience, which is giving incredibly interesting results. Uh, we include the food security and the shocks indicators uh, not directly into, into the estimation of the resilience index, but otherwise we are using this exogenous so we can run regression analysis to better understand the role of shocks uh, with respect to resilience and, and um, and food security. And finally, we have four key pillars of resilience. We've been working together with WFP and uh, other, um, many other uh, agencies and uh, stakeholders on the creation of the Resilience Measurement Technical Working Group. Uh, so we recognize there are three typical uh, capacities, uh, which are transformative, adaptive, and absorptive. We remain with our four key pillars, which are assets, uh, social safety nets, um, access to basic services, and adaptive capacities, because these are much more pragmatic and practical approaches which are needed for us to follow the, um, the evolution of uh, projects. Uh, basically, it is composed by a combination of a descriptive measure and a casual measure. This graph that you can see down here is the structural equation model that we use for estimating the resilience capacity index. So, to make a long story short, it is the same approach of psychometric. There is no direct way to measure intelligence, but the psychometrics adopted a latent variable model to proxy for intelligence. Basically, we can uh, use different uh, proxy of intelligence, like uh, logic, memory, or, I don't know, problem-solving capacity, and pulling them together, that's the basic, uh, um, say, fundamentals of the uh, latent variable models, we have a measure that we can call intelligence. We are borrowing the methodology from psychometric. The other approach, the other part of the resilience index measurement and analysis is done by regression analysis. The example that you can see here is what we do when we are under a, a panel data situation that we can follow. In this example, we have, uh, this example is coming from Uganda, we have a first drop in food security level, then some households manage to get back to at least the previous uh, uh, level of food security, and then we try to follow up and understand which have been the determinants. Of course, it's worth mentioning that this graph is exactly pointing the finger toward the relation between humanitarian and development interventions, since we can discuss, and this is more a theoretical discussion than other, uh, whether uh, increasing resilience means to allow someone to get back to the previous status or to improve the, the quality. The question is, what if the previous status was, however, not a very well, very good status? Now, so if I'm getting back to the same level I was before, but I was like right below the poverty line, I'm not doing my job or I am doing this job. Um, main outputs of our application of, of RIMA, we are doing uh, the analysis in many different uh, uh, situations and what we can do with RIMA is to uh, do a proper resilience and food security analysis. We are plenty of um, 
examples uh, the largest part of them done uh, by FAO, WFP and other UN agencies in some cases there are also examples implemented directly by the um, by local institutions like in the example of the Conseil National de la Sécurité Alimentaire the uh, Senegal, uh, you Pablo, you know where they were. Um, then we are using RIMA for impact assessment, and these are the examples that I'm going to provide you in the next uh, 27 slides. Um, and we are trying to capture the uh, seasonality and, uh, and capturing the relationship between resilience, food security, and conflict, which is an interesting experiment that we are running in different um, exercises, so a couple of them done together with IFAD and WFP in DRC and and in um, Niger, um, supported by the Uppsala University, uh, who developed a conflict module. And then, as I said, we are developing uh, something on the well-being and uh, social inclusion perception and also on the perceived resilience, um, which is one of the most interesting findings uh, we found in the latest years. And just to make, uh, just to give you an example, um, we uh, run this um, analysis for um, a data set in Uganda, a data set that we collected ourselves. Um, um, shocks occurred in the latest 20, 12 months before the data collection uh, proved to have a negative and statistically significant effect on reducing resilience capacity for those households who have been passing through. So the objective measure is saying these shocks have a negative effect on my actual resilience capacity because it's deteriorating uh, say assets, I don't remember exactly which were the channels, but they were, they were deteriorating the resilience capacity as overall. The subjective perception of those who have been receiving the shocks was otherwise the same in the country. So they were saying that those who received the shock perceived the same themselves as more resilient. And this is, there is a simple explanation to this. You went through a shock, you managed to survive, you feel more confident with yourself. So this is just to say that, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, the two aspects need to be combined, otherwise we are missing, in any case, some part of our discussion. And finally, we are developing a crisis RIMA, what we call CRIMA, that is to say a very short module of RIMA, like 20, 25 questions that we will most likely plug into the mobile devices in order to have a very rapid assessment of the resilience capacity in situations like a conflict situation or other type of uh, insecure condition. How do we do impact assessment? Uh, I'm going toward the end of the, my presentation. We normally, um, we can use also secondary sources data, uh, that is to say, data already existing. If we have to do the data collection ourselves, we can follow up from the, we can follow the, the sampling strategy, the, the questionnaire design and everything else, and then we finally we do the um, quantitative analysis integrated with the qualitative analysis. The few examples that I am uh, just um, grouping here and and then I will just talk about a couple of them. We are covering a number of countries in, in different areas of Africa. We are also covering some interesting uh, examples uh, for Kyrgyzstan and other and other uh, um, interesting state in other, another interesting interesting exercise in the Borno state in Nigeria. Um, the way we try to tackle uh, the uh, rural inequalities is by twisting our analysis in a way that uh, captures different aspects of, uh, of uh, resilience. And those are just some examples, like gender perspective or a focus on refugees or other um, most vulnerable people or most vulnerable livelihoods. And the example that I'm providing here is um, on an impact assessment from a joint resilience strategy in Somalia from WFP, uh, UNICEF and FAO. We proved to have a positive effect on the resilience capacity indicator as a whole. This is an example coming from Dolo in South Central Somalia. Another interesting example is uh, this project, is a child grant project in Lesotho. Mm, we are doing this analysis together with uh, a couple of colleagues from uh, IFAD. Um, the idea is to estimate how it is a uh, cash transfer project in increasing resilience capacity of households. Um, these are initial results that we are validating and trying for better understanding the uh, effect on resilience capacity and the channels through which this effect has been implemented. 
Finally, uh, another example is the impact of the refugees on, on the resilience capacities of the host communities. This is an example coming from uh, a data collection exercise that we are doing uh, in Uganda, in the north part of Uganda. You may know that Uganda is hosting one million South Sudanese refugees, plus on top of other 300,000 refugees from other countries. And we are doing this impact assessment for the, the South Sudanese refugees, and we are demonstrating uh, some interesting findings, like for example, the fact that those who are um, willing, uh, those who are staying in the refugees camp are maybe interested in uh, being integrated in the local economy, uh, participating in the local economy, and the largest part of the time they are seen like uh, a positive effect on the local economy because this can create opportunities even for the host community. This said, of course, there are burdens that are, are carried on by the local, uh, uh, by the host communities that need to be um, consider. That's just for giving a very broad picture. I didn't even hear the sound, so this means that I am staying. You were perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. And let us now pass the floor to Pablo Arnal for his presentation on the 4-Hour Rural Resilience Initiative, WFP. Thank you. Well, uh, I think I'm the last presentation of the day. Uh, so even if you are tired, I, I, I hope you you are interested in the lessons learned from our R4 Rural Resilience Initiative. Uh, I will structure my presentation in three, three parts. The first one, I will provide a brief overview on what's the R4 Resilience Initiative, um, then a brief overview on what are the impacts of the results of the impact evaluations of the program in Ethiopia, and then I will focus more on what are our experience on testing the RIMA tool on, um, to measure resilience and having a, an index to, um, to, ident to ident identify progress in the program. So the, um, the R4 Rural Resilience Initiative is a strategic partnership uh, between Oxfam America and WFP uh, that started in 2011 and whose main uh, objective is to strengthen the resilience of uh, food insecure smallholder farmers through integrated risk management approach. So by providing support to uh, re uh, reduce uh, risk, uh, provide tools to transfer uh, the risk like microinsurance, uh, enhance uh, access to credit and savings with, uh, with this logic, the idea is to strengthen the resilience to climatic shocks of smallholder farmers. Uh, other objective um, together with this one is to support the government on uh, imp implementing integrated risk management programs and uh, with the private sectors on the definition of the um, um, microinsurance and all, um, access to credit and savings to contribute to development of a rural finance market. By now, uh, the program has reached uh, 57,000 households that are participating. That means uh, uh, around 300,000 300, um, beneficiaries. Um, and the program is uh, working on six countries. It started in Ethiopia, uh, based on the PSNP program, uh, and expanded to uh, uh, Senegal, Kenya, Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Uh, the, the target for 2020 is to reach 500,000 households. Um, the approach uh, is based on the existing social protection uh, systems or existing social, social safety nets uh, that ensure uh, food or cash assistance uh, to ensure food security. And then building on this, we provide the tools uh, to improve uh, um, risk management. Uh, in different areas. So, for example, for our risk reduction activities, uh, what we provide is a, 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 it's a component that provides, um, looks at uh, protecting and building community and productive uh, assets uh, to uh, improve resilience to climatic shocks. So these activities are namely uh, conservation agriculture, support to climate resilience assets, um, and provide climatic, climate services. The most innovative part of this program uh, is the risk transfer component that, um, that provides uh, access to um, uh, weather index insurance um, 
to um, that, that triggers uh, in case of uh, climatic shock. So that enables households to have uh, cash immediately to face uh, the consequences of uh, uh, losses on, in crops and uh, production. Um, then, um, once we have improved production and we have uh, an insurance, it's easier to have a, a collateral uh, to, to request a credit. And so uh, the program also um, pro promotes access to credit and uh, uh, also orients um, through business advisory services on how to best invest um, the, the, to best invest to uh, on, the, on, on our own livelihood to to improve our income. And then uh, finally, uh, all these leads to improve income and then income improve savings and then uh, promote uh, household savings, group savings, and also all that's related to storage and post-harvest management. So the theory of change of the program understand that if we have improved all these uh, components at household level, we will be improving household resilience. So uh, by now, uh, we have run a set of uh, external evaluations of the program, uh, two in Ethiopia covering the period from 2009 to 2016, uh, and one recently in, in Senegal from 2013 to 2015. Those evaluations uh, are using a quasi-experimental design, uh, using uh, quantitative surveys and uh, focus group discussions on key informant and um, and the main results, for example, we will I will briefly present the results on Ethiopia. Um, we have seen that uh, in we have uh, the program has improved the food security of uh, of beneficiaries, but also there's an increase in in assets uh, as the households have increased three times the the, the animal they, they were owning before. They have uh, double the amount they can save compared to the, the control group. We have a control group that uh, in Ethiopia we have the PSNP beneficiaries and uh, building on the PSNP beneficiaries we, we, we structure the, the R4, uh, we, we piggyback on the P PSNP and provide uh, the, the insurance and access to credit. Therefore, uh, people were able to save two times more than control and uh, being able to borrow amounts five times high, higher, that's leading to increased investment in fertilizer and agricultural tools, uh, two times more than control. So according to the theory of, pro of change of the program, uh, we have increased assets and we have uh, increased uh, uh, savings and access to credit, leading to uh, what's expected, uh, an increase in, in resilience. This is, and that happened uh, after the so the, in the period 2012-2016 and 2015 the, we had a, a severe drought uh, in, in Ethiopia. So uh, we have seen that uh, the food security and all these indicators, even if there's a shock, they have been uh, increasing our, our, a long time. So. That's what uh, our uh, evalu external evaluation provides. And um, we wanted uh, to have uh, more in information or more to use uh, an index or test uh, an index in order to see explicitly in terms of resilience how changes have been over the period. And we tested the RIMA tool that uh, Marco has just presented uh, with the data set we had in, from, uh, from the baselines and outcome monitoring from uh, Malawi on the period 2015-2017. Uh, this program um, is uh, oriented to 10,000 10, <coughs> participants and uh, provides insurance, provides savings and, and loans uh, associations and uh, activities on conservation farming and water and, sanit and sanitation. So um, to run the, the RIMA analysis, we selected a set of variables that are representative for the different pillars. 
uh, that uh, Marco has uh, presented, the assets, we consider domestic assets, agricultural tools, livelihood ownership, and agricultural land own, that are the most representative for the area of intervention. Uh, for access to basic service, we consider distance to water, safe access to water, sanitation, access to electricity, as uh, and um, in terms of adapt adaptive capacity, we define diversity of income sources, education of head of household, uh, the access of agricultural advice, uh, the inverse dependency ratio, and uh, the household saving capacity. Finally, in terms of social safety net, uh, we consider that the most important variables were community support, agricultural assistance, and food assistance. With, with this set, uh, the analysis we run uh, provides us with the RCI, the Resilience Capacity Index, that uh, show us in this graph that in the period uh, the control group has has been stable over the, the, the period, no changes have been observed, and uh, the treatment group, that's uh, the R4 beneficiaries, have uh, have seen an, uh, a slightly in, in improvement on their resilience capacity index, showing that the intervention may have a, an, an impact on, on household resilience. Um, Com to complement this information, we've seen that over the period what happened with, for, with the different pillars, we've seen that uh, for the control group, the structure of uh, the IFC, uh, resilience capacity index stays the same, but for the R4 beneficiaries, the reliance on, on, ha on assets has increased and the dependency from social safety nets have de ha has decreased over the period. In terms of inequality, we've seen that uh, female-headed households are less resilient than male-headed households, but even uh, with this initial uh, gap, we are, we've seen that there's an evolution of, uh, of both male and female-headed households on their re uh, resilience over the period. And the most important part in terms of programming uh, for, for us was to identify with the causal inference what were the main determinants of resilience to food insecurity, being here uh, household assets, savings, community support, and access to water. With this information, we are able to uh, orient future interventions focusing on these aspects in order to have more impact on, um, on household resilience. So this uh, test of, uh, of the RIMA tool has provided um, interesting results in terms of uh, showing what can be the, the, the effectiveness on improving household resilience, uh, has oriented us in terms of where to uh, focus the next or uh, the following phases, and also on how to, the need to address uh, and target specifically uh, female-headed households uh, that are less resilient at the moment. So by now, uh, we've seen that uh, with this kind of approach, we can more or less say that we are improving the resilience of most uh, smallholder farmers to climate shocks, and that uh, this uh, RIMA methodology that we have already tested uh, provides the insightful uh, information for programming. Um, so this is uh, just, uh, I, have, I, th I hope I, I'm in time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Pablo. Um, we have um, 15 minutes for uh, the Q&A session. Let me open the floor. Um, kindly introduce yourself. Raghav Gaiha. I'm very uneasy about the separate presentation of the vulnerability index and the resilience uh, capacity, because these are intrinsically related. And the second point is that vulnerability is about the risk of falling below a poverty threshold. And I don't see any connection between such a measure and the 12 indicators that you've listed. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, if you're arriving at some kind of a unified index, then I'd like to know exactly how the weighting is done. That's crucial. On the resilience measure, I'm not sure what exactly is on the left-hand side of the equation. And, uh, and I'd like to know what that is.
please. Um, Katsu Singh from the University of Manchester. I have two questions. One question uh, is for uh, the first presenter, uh, Lisandro. Um, uh, so you mentioned the PBAS, performance based alloc allocation system. But I, I wonder if there is any causality between the first two uh, dimensions and the third dimension. I mean, so if, for instance, the transparency is high, as the needs may be low, the, the other way around, if need is high, transparency is low. In, in, in that case, so there might be a tricky to use the aggregate indicator for the allocation. So this is the first point. And the second question is directed to the second uh, and the third presenter, so which is related to Professor Kaya's question. So I understand, so you basically use a latent variable model. Uh, based on the observable characteristics. Uh, quickly looking at RIMA2 report, there is a close relationship uh, between the observable characteristics and uh, the RIMA2 index based on that. If that is the case, why don't you use the observable characteristics which is affecting uh, the RIMA2 index most uh, rather than using a complicated system? Uh, that might be a better uh, way of targeting rather than using RIMA2. Thank you. Shall we take another question or prefer to answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this side, please. Okay. Um, my name is Mustafa Jami. I'm with the Islamic Development Bank. First part of my question has been asked, so I would jump to the next part. Um, in the event that um, these indices have been used within the same context, what is the, how do we mitigate against you know, over prescribing in terms of um, responding to the same um, natural disaster. Because we're talking about PBAS, we're talking about REMA, and then we are also talking about the, the Africa Risk Capacity Index. Thanks. Andrea Cornia, University of Florence. Um, I think it's for all the panelists, but uh, Pablo mentioned some of the correlates. So if I have land, if I have savings, if I have cattle and so on and so forth, uh, in a way, I have my own resources, so I'm uh, more resilient. But are there other correlates? For instance, education. Uh, we studied the, the mortality and transition in Eastern Europe, and it was uh, quite clear that uh, people with higher level of education had a much greater capacity to adjust to terrible situations. Uh, so uh, I wonder... Um, I don't know, the community characteristics, whether these are cohesive communities or non -co I mean, What are the factors that other the, the obvious one uh, improve uh, resilience at the individual level? Let me take the last one, this side, please. Hello, this is Simone Lombardini from Oxfam, Great Britain. And thank you very much, very, very interesting presentations. And I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is uh, if it is possible to uh, expand a bit more on the decision-making process for uh, defining the indicators and the dimensions that uh, counts for measuring resilience. Well, it's both for uh, Marco and Pablo. And the second one is uh, I'm understanding that the measurement framework is uh, designed around measuring resilience at household level. And uh, I wonder if uh, there is the, if you see that there is the need to also uh, disaggregate, not just by looking at the uh, female head of the households, but also looking at measurements to look within uh, the households if there are inequalities around resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to start? Lisandro? Okay. Thank you very much. Given that I was the only one for whom the alarm actually sounded, I'm going to be very brief. I don't want it to happen again. So um, v very quickly on two or three of the points that, uh, that were mentioned. For us, in terms of the selection of the indicators that go into the PBAS, go into the IBI, go into the different dimensions or go into your first question, one key um, issue had been also the data availability, making sure that we can have this data available for the 170 
countries that we need, that we need to account for. This is a clear limitation because we need data, the latest to be updated every three years for 170 countries using similar methodologies. Now, this index ended up with 12 indicators, each of which have an equal weight. This was also discussed with our executive board uh, for a long period, and I see the Mexican ambassador here. But the reality was the absence of a really a clear pre-consensus on what, which of these indicators actually have play a better or a bigger role than others. So what we have in this index is 12 indicators that are equally weighted. Another important consideration was that we wanted, as I said, this is part of a formula, and it, the formula also has the GNI per capita, and what we wanted is to have an index that did not correlate with GNI per capita, that added additional dimensions to the measurement of poverty. Therefore, all the 12 that you see do not have any correlation or a specific measurement of poverty because our way of defining the needs is a combination of this IBI plus the number of rural poor people in a given country plus the GNI per capita. All of that gives you a measure of what we call the needs, which is equivalent to, if you want, to the poverty, um, a proxy to the poverty measure in every country. The second and final point that I wanted to address was the issue of the correlation. I believe you were asking the, the PBAS formula has two components, the needs and the performance. Now, a priori, when all of us, uh, before we undertook a lot of the analysis that, that went through into this, I think, and, and it will happen to you as well, you might assume that the countries that have the greatest needs have the worst performance. And then we talked for a long time about this without realizing when we went into the data that this wasn't the case, actually. Because of the way that we define performance, not necessarily the poorest countries were the poorest performers. And this is very clear. So one of the issues of our PBAS is, for example, the way in which countries use effectively the resources that they receive from IFA. That is a measure of performance. There are African countries that actually use the resources very effectively. We have the case of Rwanda, a very clear top performer. But when you compare Rwanda with, if you want, with uh, Brazil or with other upper middle income countries, the resources, the, the, the economic situation is significantly different, yet they are more effective in utilizing the resources. So there was basically no straightforward correlation between the two components. And as I said before, it's also a multiplicative formula. So many elements enter in the definition of this, which makes this a little bit less linear than one that our thinking actually uh, usually goes to. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lisandro. Marco, Pablo? Okay, thank you for the very interesting and challenging questions. So what is in the left hand side of the equation? Um, basically, as, as I mentioned, the RIMA uses two approaches. One is the latent variable model and the other one is the regression analysis. The response is quite straightforward when I think about the regression analysis. On the left hand side, there is food security, change in food security, capacity of recovery, food security level, for example. But we can even actually use RCI, Resilience Capacity Index. And on the right hand side, at that point, we factor, you know, like key household socioeconomic characteristics which are not included in the RCI or the whole list of shocks. That's the reason why we keep them outside of the estimation model. And so exactly to see which shock has had the negative, most likely, effect on resilience capacity index or on uh, food security. When it, uh, take, when it gets back to the um, structural equation model, the way the structural equation model act which is the, the model that we use for latent variable model, basically you are considering more resilience if you get a higher level of food security. So this is in the, the up part, in the upper part of the, of the graph, and then all the rest is, uh, is composed by the different determinants. So the, the structural equation models basically are two, is like simultaneous equations. So we have two equation, equations that are estimated contemporarily. Um, why grouping, basically the question of why grouping them together instead of uh, letting the different components separated, which is basically the point of Professor Marti Ravallian. No? So why do you have to create? It's absolutely true and we like to unpack, exactly like Pablo showed, uh, we unpack the different components so to get and see the, 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 say the details of the, uh, of the action. But when, you, when, it take, when, you, when, when it is up to the 
measurement of the impact or for the targeting purposes, you then need to have a composite index, which is grouping together. That's the reason why we create this resilience capacity index. We linearly transform it into a percentage, which ranges from zero to 100, of course, so that we can see whether we had had an impact or not. That's the reason why we are grouping them together, but strongly recognizing the point uh, raised. On the fact of the different uh, components, different uh, elements, like for example education, and that's a key point uh, which is uh, uh, constantly, to some extent, undermining some aspect of the resilience measurement. Because the, you mentioned the, the example of education, the education is a uh, uh, directly pointing at one of the key features of every resilience measurement, the time constraint. That is to say, we measure things, say, in within a range of three years, just to say an example, and education has, of course, a, a much longer effect on uh, the, the households. So, uh, if one can, uh, if I can say a thing a little bit extreme, but the, the, an actual uh, um, education may also have a negative effect on the short period, no? because I send my kids to school, so they're not helping me looking after the, the, the goats or whatever. But of course, I have a, a bigger return on the long term, which is underestimated by every single indicator in our case, because it's difficult to plug into, uh, into a resilience estimator like RIMA the non-linearity assumption. So that is to say, how this is going to have an effect on the long run. It's very complicated. In terms of the process of how we selected the indicators and the variables, well, that's, that's a long story. Um, it's, it's partially done on a consensus basis, and partially is done by literature review, partially done by the work of the technical working group on resilience measurement. Uh, the, the, the things that have been uh, done by this the group are quite similar by this point of view because they are setting up a, a number of standards and procedures uh, and then uh, you can get there and understand why they're using those three capacities and why we are using the four capacities, not the four pillars, because it's uh, because we are FAO, so we are much more pragmatic, we are not so much academic by this point of view. The variables behind the, the single pillars uh, well, we have been doing a lot of literature review on the most used indicator for proxying, say, access to basic services or to proxy adaptive capacity. Then we can discuss, we have in, every, in every estimation uh, exercise that we do, we discuss together with the key stakeholders and key informants of the country, we test uh, uh, the contextualization of the RIMA, sorry, of the RIMA tool in every single context. And, and finally, to a certain extent, also to the constraint that we have. I may also be willing to include, I don't know, the most fancy and sophisticated variable, but if the data set is limited, I need to adapt to what I have. Um, finally, a very, very good point on the on the on the gender and i strongly recognize the limitation of our analysis in the sense of including just the the the, the example of the the gender of the household head which is extremely limited and is also extremely uh, they, i would say like weak now because there are many difficult many, many problems in understanding who is the household head or if there is a confusion between the household head and respondent is not easy that's what we have so far, but we're working together with our social protection division, the gender division, ESP in FAO, and we are developing, uh, we are strengthening our uh, like our capacity of doing a gender-oriented analysis, which most likely will look at the individual level, because that's also another point that is uh, incredibly important for um, for gender perspective. I think I'm done. I think I don't have answer, questions to answer, but <laughs> no, I'm just in, in online with uh, the two questions of, of Oxfam in terms of how we choose the variables and the way of uh, disaggregating. For us, it will be very interesting to disaggregate more on female and male, um, but uh, by now it's just a test that we are running, so we are at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Marco, please. Yeah, sorry, because I forgot to mention how the different tools can be integrated. Sorry, I, I had something in my... Well, basically, um, the largest part of the time, at least for our, from, from our side, we try to integrate with other existing tools in the, in the country, especially in the Sahel area. We've been doing a number of uh, workshops together with UNICEF, WFP, the SEALs, of course, and many other actors to see how we can integrate the different tools, which are, at the end of the day, bringing another little piece of the information. So the way we try to integrate
integrated the different tools is exactly by, you know, for example, I, I can give you a very basic example, the Cadre Harmonize or IPC, how it is called. Um, that's, this is going to provide us a, like a, a large view, a large understanding of the situation. It has been actually implemented and adopted as a targeting tool for the, um, the exercises that we are doing together with IFAD and WFP in uh, the RDC and the Niger. Uh, so we use this as for, for framing the, the analysis, for understanding the situation, and therefore for designing, which also is contributing to the selection of variables and indicators. And then we can, for example, integrate with the rapid assessment tool. For example, there is uh, something from UNDP developed. It's a very qualitative uh, assessment for resilience, and it was designed by Catherine Fitzgibbon many years ago. It's called COBRA, something like that. And we can use it for uh, you know, integrating the different, uh, the different analysis. RIMA is quite intense. So if we can integrate with the rapid assessment tool, which is fine. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. So it's uh, 6 p.m. sharp. Um, I think we can close the session unless there is any very burning final questions that the audience would like to ask. Otherwise, uh, let me just remind you that you are all invited to a cocktail. Uh, which is served um, in front of the IFAD uh, um, executive dining room. Thank you very much for your participation and thank you for the thank three you. presenters. Thank you.